Some of it was. Things that we have to read on the spot, you mean? We're on the air. Call the meeting to order. Everyone stay in the flag. Flag allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Next item on the agenda is just introduction introductions to board members. We have Mr. Beach and Mr. Cotton. Mr. Wood, Mr. Colbert, <coughs> and the chair, Mr. Ingram. The next item on the agenda is going to the second session. You're going to be allowed to stay here. We will move into the town hall to meet with our lawyer. Um, and then when we come out of executive session, uh, we will continue on with the agenda, which is approval of the minutes and then the impeachment. So, at this time, I'd like to move a motion to go into executive session pursuant to 1 MRS 5046E to discuss with legal counsel the interpretation appeal of Mr. Ad Adan Eldaraji. Is there a motion? I'll motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor to go into executive session? Okay. They were on the air. Uh, like a motion to come out of executive session. I'd like to make a motion to come out of executive session. In a second. All in favor of coming out of the desk second. Executive session. Motion carries. Okay. Just want to quickly. There were no decisions obviously made in executive session. We don't have the right to do that. We uh, we're going to come out of executive session. We we're just there to. Get a little bit more background on on this case because it, it is a bit confusing and we want to make sure we did this correct. Okay, now there's a couple, there's three things that we have to determine so that we can hear this case. And of course, I've managed to lose my paper. Don't take it. All my notes. I'm more than happy, Mr. Chairman, if it's helpful to frame those up. Yeah, just, I would like, I don't know how to put that. Okay, let's, uh, I'm going to let uh, the lawyer, I'm sorry. I've got Leah Rachin, Lee, Attorney Rachin, yes. Yeah, our attorney, um, frame up the three questions that we, we discussed for the three issues. Sure. Okay, so, um, I think the standard protocol here is that you open the public hearing, you hear from the applicant first, then you hear from the code office, um, members of the public who may wish to weigh in, and then the applicant um, has the opportunity to respond to anything that's been raised, right? And um, like every appeal that comes or any application that comes before you, there's the substance of the matter, but then there are these threshold issues that you have to, or the applicant has to satisfy before you can jump into the substance. And those basically are germane to this board's jurisdiction to hear the, uh, um, hear what is coming before you. And so there, there are three things. The first is uh, jurisdiction, meaning whether this uh, board has the authority to hear what they are being asked to do. And that's simply because all municipal boards, this board, municipal officials only have, we, we say they're creatures of statute and ordinance, and they only have that authority which they've been specifically granted. So you've got to establish uh, that you have the authority to, to hear 
the application. The second um, hoop that applicants must all jump through is this uh, notion of standing, meaning they have right title and interest in the property that's at issue. Um, and without that, this board can't make a determination, you know, it, it, I give the silly example, but if I, Mr. Chairman, wanted to apply for a building permit on your property, clearly I can't do that because I don't have sufficient right title and interest to ask for that. And the third thing um, is timeliness, right? Your ordinance prescribes, I believe it's a 30-day window um, for in order for the application to be timely that the decision being either here in an administrative appeal, the decision being appealed from, or if it's an interpretation, it has to be 30 days from that interpretation. So um, those are those threshold, excuse me, threshold issues that I think need to be determined before you can get into the merits of the case. And so just for expediency and practical purposes, it may make sense to have the applicant speak to those jurisdictional issues first. Um, hear from the code officer if they are inclined to make any submissions in that regard. Make your threshold determinations. And if you find jurisdiction, then of course you get into the merits. Um, but that's how I would conceive of it. Perhaps you might want to hear from the parties if that's a, a, a process which they are amenable to, if they agree to it. Um, I think. I. Uh I think I'm going to supersede the asking if they're amenable because I want to go through them one at a time and at that point in time the parties will have an opportunity to speak uh, if it's necessary on each one. Yes, Sorry. Board of Appeals? No, I'm uh, meeting with the... Uh, Jeremy, everybody's in the auditorium house. Uh, so sorry. sorry. <coughs> we might, Again, get, we um, might get a lot of that, Mr. Chair. Sorry. We're going to um, go through these one at a time. That's my intention. Um, and the board will vote on each one so that uh, we have a clear understanding of as we pr proceed if we have jurisdiction to actually hear this appeal. So the first one is on interpretation of the jurisdiction. I'm going to let the lawyer speak to the interpretation. Sure. Um, so, you know, when, it, when we look at this board's jurisdiction, you are allowed to enter. You, your powers and duties are with respect to variances. That's not this. Administrative appeals, meaning if there's a concern around or... Um, a disagreement with the decision of the code enforcement officer, then the appealing party can ask this board to decide whether or not that decision was supported or it was correct or not. And then the third is an interpretation of this ordinance. And I say, I'm using air quotes because we're talking about the land use ordinance, this ordinance. So those are your three, um, you know, your three basically what your authority is those those are the things that you can hear and so you have to determine with respect to this application you have before you um, what it actually is there may be some confusion as to whether it's an administrative appeal or an interpretation you hear from the applicant in that regard you make a determination if you have um, authority to hear it and then um, with respect to interpretation you know, I look at the application and it says, it actually talks about an app, an interpretation of what it appears to be a state statute um, and whether or not that's an interpretation of this ordinance is something you, you might want to hear from the parties about. Okay. So, going to our ordinance, uh, to me, it's pretty clear on the 10.3c that we have the authority to make interpretations of the ordinance. And I believe the applicant is asked for an interpretation to the ordinance. So I don't feel like I need any input from anyone <clears throat> on that. It seems pretty clear to me. Does anyone else on the board feel like we need any more information on our jurisdiction on 10.3c, which says we have the right to hear an interpretation? I think it does make sense to ask the applicant if that is, in fact, what he's oh, okay. asking for. Yeah. I believe I saw you nodding your head, so yes, I, I didn't ask. <laughs> yep. No disagreement. Okay. 
So I would like, I'm going to go through this one at a time. I just feel like it'll be much cleaner that way. So I'm going to look for a motion that we have jurisdiction for interpreting this uh, application. And just before you do that, Mr. Chairman, I think what's important is, yes, you have, you, it's a, you have jurisdiction over interpretation. I think one of the issues is whether what is asked for, the interpretation was asked for of a subdivision law, a state statute, and whether or not that is akin to this ordinance. Well, I think we'll take that as the second step, if oh, that's okay. okay. Sure. I, I just thought I just, so, um, <clears throat> do I have a motion? Um, to agree that we have jurisdiction in the ordinance by 10.3c to hear this FBA. I'd like to make a motion to see that the board agrees that we have a <coughs> jurisdiction to make an interpretation of part of the law. You have a motion? Second? Second. All in favor? Okay. <coughs> the next piece of this, I know this is long and drawn out, but I just wanted to make sure I'm comfortable where we're headed with this. Uh, the application is for state statute, and so that concerned me when I first saw the application because I didn't feel like there was, I didn't know if we had the right to hear, to interpret state statute. So I'm going to let our, my, our lawyer again speak to that issue, and then if there's any concerns on either party, we'll let them speak. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So. Um, I, I share that concern in the sense that it's very clear when we were talking about before that this board's authority is the interpretation of this ordinance. Now, in the application itself, it asks for an interpretation of state subdivision law, which ordinarily I would say, you know what, I, I think that's beyond your purview to interpret state law. However, if you look back to this ordinance being the land use ordinance, if you look at the definition of subdivision in your own ordinance, it just basically cites out to the exact provision that Mr. Aldaraji has cited. And so while ordinarily I would say this board does not have the right to interpret state statute, because it was adopted, I would, uh, and of course we want to hear from the parties on that, but because it was adopted by the town meeting as part of your land use ordinance, then I think um, you could find that you do have authority to consider that in, or, or interpret it, so okay. to speak. Yeah. Does but you may want to hear from the parties on that. Uh, I will ask either party, uh, Mr. Aldaraji, I'm assuming you provided us the... Up, uh, me and Can Dick. you please stand at the yeah, microphone? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, uh, me and Terry looked it up, and it did state exactly what she had mentioned. It refers you back to the statute okay. in, the, in the ordinance book. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable interpretation, too, and I just want to point out in your last decision on this you actually you actually made a finding on that and you it's sort of similar kind of so, somewhat similar uh, situation where it was a little bit arguable it's a little gray but you decided you did have jurisdiction to decide the issue it's a little different context to the building permit but um, but you did go ahead and decide a subdivision last year last time so I think that'll be consistent with what okay. you've done. does the board have any questions for anyone on this or do you feel like there's, uh, we're ready to make a motion to, uh, that we do have statute to interpret main, main statute, have authority to interpret main statute. Is that a, are we okay on that? Mm -hmm. okay. Do we have a motion on the table? A motion. Okay, Mr. Beat makes a motion. Is there a second? Mr. Wood seconds. All in favor that we do have jurisdiction to interpret <coughs> the state statute because it's in our ordinance. All in favor. favor. I think we passed the first two hurdles. The third hurdle, I believe, is timeliness. I think you want you could do that. There's also the standing issue that right title and interest, whether oh, I'm or sorry. not. Yes. Yeah. I, I see either either or is that, fine. That was the third. That was yeah. yes. I we got through now. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Right title and interest. Um, the question is, and I'm going to let the lawyer speak to right title and interest. Sure. So um, under Maine law, there's this concept that 
in order, as I said, to apply, you have to have a sufficient right title and interest in the property at, at issue. And so um, I think the concern here is that there was some mention that in the application itself, I think it lists the property at issue as um, assessor's map U161-1, and that um, Mr. Aldaraji is not the owner of that property. Um, I think my the the subsequent submissions show that there are other names added as um, applicants, but I you know I think we want to hear. I, I don't. Believe that those folks also are either um, registered, not registered, but the re of record as owners of that property. So, might want to have um, Mr. Aldaraji speak to that issue. Mr. Aldaraji, <coughs> uh, as your application indicates, I'm I'm here to get an interpretation of a code. This has. Uh, no reference to any land that's just uh, was provided because I was asked to provide it so I'm looking for an interpretation of a right. code of, of a code and statute I understand and but the lawyers said that we can't hear this unless you are making it it's got to be on a parcel of land that you own an individual just can't come up and ask this board for an interpretation without them it being on some parcel of land that they own. Well, I own all that land, so I guess I'm clear there. I should be covered there, right? I own all that land that, that we're speaking of. Well, I believe we have a title of record, a tax record that shows that, that Mr. Morin Am I missing that owns that piece of property? The current current owner of sixty one one is Jared Morin. Right, but that lot was divided, uh, so there's a back lot on there, and that back lot was part of the land that I own. Well, on the tax record, 611 is is shown as owned by Jared Moore. Right, but I'm the one I'm the one who's owns the land that I'm referring to, so I'm not sure where you got so that. Do you? So, in the assessor's map, do you have a lot here that you can reference that you own? 611 isn't owned by you, and that's the question. Do you have a lot that you can give us that you own? Well, it's the same. It's the same loss that we've discussed. Up, I mean, okay, hold on. Okay, so that so these are. Do I bring these up to somebody? Or? Are you referencing the chart or the um, tax map that you submitted in conjunction with your application? Yes. One, two, and three. Yes. So 61 2 was number one, 61 1 is two. Is that the one we're looking at? That's correct. Yep. Right. And those are the three original lots that Mr. Pellegrino divided. Mm -hmm. And those are the three right there that at the time of division. I own these three lots. After he divided it and sold it to me, I own these three lots that you're saying are illegal. I just, I guess I'm looking at, do you own 61 too? Yes. So basically we can amend this assessor's, your application to say that instead of 61 one? Sure. Sure. It's just, I understand it may be uh, trivial to you, but I mean, we, we can't decide on something that we, that you don't own. Right. Mr. Chairman, I just, can we ask for clarification? Sure. Are you the current owner of any of these three lots? I am the current owner of all three of these lots except for the front half of 61 and the front half of 61-1. So further split from what we see 
He yeah, I've been, I've been doing this for 15 years. Okay, and so I've been doing this legally for 15 years. So yes, 61 got divided into two lots, and 61-1 got divided into two lots. Okay, so it's further divided than what's shown on this map. Correct. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, you may wish to hear from the code office about if they have any objection for to an amendment to this particular application. We don't have any objection to amending the application to refer to one of the lots uh, that Mr. Eldrazi owns. Okay. I do think sort of it's a little concerning what I just heard, which is that the tax maps, oh. there's some disagreement, it sounds like, between uh, Israel Doji and the assessor. So I don't know I don't know anything about that. And so, so I think the town's going to have to look into that because I think what you're referring to is the actual tax maps today. Right. Um, and that, so that's, that's the uh, map of record for assessing purposes. So that will have to be cleared up at some point in the future. But to the extent that there's a lot in this uh, quote unquote subdivision, we have no objection to moving moving the application forward on that, that basis. Okay. Does the board have any further questions? Are you comfortable um, with making a motion that we have jurisdiction to proceed, even though the well, we with the amended, I guess. Uh, Application to reference one of the lots in Mr. Algiargi, Elder. Sorry, Mr. Algiargi, a tough name for me. Um, that he owns. So I it's a part oh. of a part of a lot. It seems to be it's a part of one of these. Can you come up one more time, um, Mr. Algiargi? Sure. So, if we were to pull the tax records for these lots here, your name is going to appear on one of these tax records, is that true? That's true. Do, do we know that's true? <laughs> um, actually, I was just pointing out to the attorney that if you look in the documentation I provided you guys, the copy of the billing permit application, I actually have a, um, a tax card for the mother lot that you own. Okay, so there is there is a tax card here. Uh, it is uh, U one sixty one two eight. So I have no objection to that because he he does he does have. I, I literally provided sixty one two sixty one two got it sixty one two a sixty one two a let me put you guys back on U one sixty one two a okay tax card that. Mm -hmm. All right. Did I totally confuse everyone with what I just said? Are we comfortable with what we're making a motion on? Do I have a motion to, uh, with the understanding that Mr. Eldaraji does have standing here because he does own one of the lots in question? I'll make a motion to accept that. Is there a second? Mr. Wood seconds. Uh, all in favor? Okay. The uh, third or fourth, I guess now, the way I put it, hurdle we have to uh, reach is uh, timeliness. Would you speak to timeliness? Sure. Please? So. Um, as we noted that it's very clear in the ordinance that in order to have this board to have the authority to hear any appeal it must be or, or appeal or application I should say it must be timely and um, under the ordinance it talks about how it must be within brought within 30 days of whatever decision or interpretation is being at, is at issue here and so um, I think it's important for us to hear evidence from Mr. Alderaji and also whatever evidence the code office has with respect to this issue of timeliness, especially and most importantly, what is the date of the interpretation that we are looking at here? Because we can, all, we have a certain time period in the ordinance to hear hear that. Yeah. Okay. Um, would you like to speak to that, Mr. Alderaji? I, I, I probably have a better 
better um, chance answering that if I had a denial letter. If you guys could provide me a denial letter, I can see the date on that and go from there. Uh, one thing I think is important, Mr. Chairman, is of course that you know the burden is always on the applicant to establish um, all elements of the application, and so you know I think that. It, it, the burden is on the applicant to determine timeliness, and so I'm not quite sure what the evidence is regarding the date of the interpretation you have a concern about, when that interpretation was made that you're um, asking this board to. <clears throat> I have 30 days after the denial, correct? Well, am I allowed to have a denial letter or not? Did, was it one available? I requested it several times. I believe you have a sheet in your application, my application, that discusses how I was not getting any information from anybody I was requesting this denial letter from. M so. Mr. Chairman, I I'm happy to address that if you'd like sure. me to. Okay. So, again, not having been part of this, you know, I'm not. I think, Mr. Eldraji, what you were asking for was. I think, Mr. If you're, if I'm interpreting this correctly, um, Attorney Phoenix had provided a letter. I believe it was in September, right? And after that, or even maybe before it, you, you were asking for um, somebody to refute that. But I think what's at issue, and again, we want to hear from you and the and the code officer, is um, you had indicated that you disagreed with an interpretation of, um, you know, the subdivision definition that was ostensibly made by the code office. So that, what we're asking for is the date of that. Um, you have made an appeal, so obviously there must have been some kind of decision or revocation or interpretation that you are asking this board to revisit. And so that is the important date from which the clock starts ticking. Okay, so that would be this email here. <clears throat> And it was dated November, November 8th, 2023. I, I have to say I'm a bit puzzled by that because your, your, your appeal was prior to that. Your appeal or your application, was, I believe, was dated September 26th. So it's, if you're yeah. asking, it's difficult to, the, the chronology is problematic that if you made an application on, September 26th, and you're saying that the decision you're asking to be revisited is in months after that, that's a bit puzzling. Well, according to my records, I guess I just never received a denial letter, so therefore I just went ahead and assumed the denial letter was the email telling me that the ordinance was going to be um, interpreted as the word preceding meaning afterwards and not prior to. So I only have emails. I don't have a denial letter. And you don't need one, sir. You, you just mentioned that there was an interpretation you were told in an email. So what was the date of that email? Um, I guess I'm not sure if I can give you a exact date because this has been a conversation in an email that's been going back and forth 
um, regarding the statute interpretation. So without a denial letter, I don't have a date for you. Mr. Chairman, you may want to hear from the code office. Yes, yeah. Could you uh You'll see the denial letter is in the original, the code enforcement BOA documentation. July the 18th. email dating dated July 18th that starts with, good evening, Adnan. Unfortunately, I appear to have made a mistake in issuing the permit as it stands. So that was his revocation, if you continue to read that email. So the denial went out to him via email on July 18th. I could just <clears throat> add to that. Certainly. <clears throat> so I think th that was the last we I saw looking through, or the code officer saw the last sort of denial or interpretation. <clears throat> Excuse me. There were obviously some series of emails back and forth, and then um, and then Mr. Aldaraji did submit a letter from Attorney Phoenix um, on September twelfth. Uh, and two, and I think it was, and then two weeks later, the appeal was was filed. So it was a two week period after, and and the letter did make an argument. And so this is, I do want to address this briefly, even though it, I'm not going to say it gets to the substance, but it kind of gets to the, I think why where we are here, and maybe where a solution is going forward, if that's if that's okay. So I don't think that there. I think the last issue, uh, the last issue that could have been appealed from our perspective was that July 18th. Um, letter. There's also one just after that. To, if you want to be, I think there's an additional one on July 25th where Irish did respond to another sort of re, uh, a response to that July 18th email where she did say that it was um, she referred to the the lot split in 2007. So maybe t July 25th. Once the letter, came, so that's sort of the last decision, quote unquote, that we can see, other than some you know back and forth. One of the issues here is, and, and there has not been a response. I think there was also a response at some point from from Irish after the letter saying, essentially, the board has spoken. I think this is important to point this out because I think that's where we are, right? Which is that Irish was operating under this board made a determination about the 2007 split. And in what you said, and if, I'm sure you have a copy of it, right? You had, so in your ruling, you said that that lot split violated the subdivision ordinance. You said they had they have got to go to the planning board, and then you also said even if that sort of 2007 conveyance, sort of beyond that, you you made a finding or a, a conclusion that now beyond that, the, the all the land is now in the same common ownership. So now it's the same tractor parcel of land again. That's you know that's your finding number 25. And so you're looking at the same lot for subdivision purposes now. So, you know, you know, more than two lots in a five-year period would require planning board review. So that was what you found. So that's what Irish is operating under. There, there was different. And what I will concede tonight is there is additional. There was additional argument made, and it doesn't appear that that was that argument was made um, back or, or even considered back. And what was the date of this? 2022. Um, if you look at the the former code officer's decision that was being appealed, it, it simply said, and I, there's a version of it in your packet, the original denial letter, it said there were three conveyances, three lots back in 2007, and that would be a subdivision unless any of those divisions fell within one of the exceptions. That was right in her, her letter. So it said unless, but it didn't, there was no information that way, and I didn't, I didn't see in the record where anyone made an argument one way or the other that there was an exception or not. So. That was the information from the former CEO. That's the information you had. You determined there was a violation. So Irish cannot ignore your, from my perspective, cannot ignore your determinations. That, that was a determination. Now, I will say there is a new argument that has been raised. There has not been a determination from her office on that. Um, and I agree with Mr. Elder. There has not been. Uh, and that was partly because the appeal was filed. So you're sitting in, a, there's an appeal. At that point, you have to you know let the appeal process go forward um, and I also did see a letter so I read mr. Phoenix's letter I actually even spoken to him briefly and let him know that uh, there was this decision from the Board of Appeals that was still the holding 
in my view, sort of controlled that subdivision for the, this purposes unless the board decided. Otherwise, or there was new information that could be presented to the board. Um, I did see the letter in the packet tonight, which I actually hadn't seen. I'll just I'll tell you, but it looks like it was dated August 8th from James Monday. And on the back of it, there's a letter from Attorney Whitney, who, who appears that he was probably the, the real estate attorney at the time. And he said, and from 2006, and so he said, because the uh, Pellegrinos lived in the property for more than five years, they can convey three separate parcels without running into subdivision problem. However, it's very important, as he said, uh, that the two non-house lots be conveyed and recorded first. That's because, um, and I, I'm only saying this because I want to sort of get this to the record. You don't have to make a, a substantive de determination tonight if you can't get over the final threshold. But that's because under the statute, there are two, there is an exception, and but you have to meet both parts of the exception, in my view. So there's two parts, and I just want to read it. And this is the issue that's, that's, that uh, is in the letter. It says you, there's an exception if the lots are created by a subdivider who, number one, has retained, I mean, they're retaining a lot for their subdivider's own use as a single family residence. That's the first element. And they had that residence had been their residence, their principal residence, for at least five years preceding that division. So that you have to have had it for at least five years as your principal residence before you divided it out. And you have to retain it for their own use as a single family residence. Now that has never been fully defined. What, how long does it mean to be retained? How long do I have to keep it? It does not say anything in the statute. There are other exceptions that do explicitly say. For example, there's a gift provision that says you have to keep it for five years before you can divide it out. It doesn't say that in this one. It just says you have to retain it. So many real estate lawyers do take the position that's consistent with what I see with Mr. Whitney saying and consistent with what I've seen Mr. Phoenix say, which is retained literally means it could be for a second longer, meaning you have to record it last in place. And so that's why I believe it says this in this letter. He says it's very important you, you record the, the house lot last. That's why he said it, because you have to retain it as your, as your, uh, as your single family residence. Now, whether that's the intention of the legislature or not, I don't know, but it, but it is, in my view, a somewhat reasonable interpretation of that provision. Um, and so to the extent that there is no appeal here tonight, because maybe there's not a 30-day provision, I think what we are willing to say is the code officer is willing to look at a new application, given that new information, but, there, but we really did, and I felt like I wanted to explain this, it really felt like we, our hand, her hands were, held, were tied a bit because of the very clear holding you guys made last time, mm -hmm. is that there was a subdivision violation with the three lots in 2007. Um, so I'll just put that out there. I don't know if that's something that, uh, I'll just say that. We are, the code officer is willing to take a look at that with this new information. Um, we had the two things, she had the two things happening, which was there was an appeal filed, and there was also your previous determination that was sort of holding that back. And I'll rest on that. Thank you. So, Mr. Aldrogi, um, the letter that we have is July 18th or potentially July 25th. Um, would you like to speak on that? Well, the letter I, excuse me, the letter I gave you with my application is um, dated September 12th, the letter I gave you. Now, that's the letter that was requested for me to provide by a lawyer that specialized in real estate, and so I complied with that request from the court enforcement officer. The appeal that we have here is dated 926, though. And I'm not sure that this board has the authority. But well, this is 912, so that's less than two weeks. From, but we're all of August. I mean, July, August, September. No, this we, uh, we have September, a 30-day time period in se our September board. 12th. Is this letter is dated September 12th? But the. 
denial was in July. No, because if I'm being asked to provide a letter for clarification to find all the facts, fact finding, and this letter was given by the lawyer on September 12th, and she looks and reads the letter, and decides that either A, agrees or disagrees, and at that point, I would assume that's when the clock should start. I guess I'm going to ask for a little clarification to the lawyer. Mm -hmm. The 30 days has really got, kind of got me stumped. Sure, it is. It, it can get confusing. So um, I think you've heard from the code office that the interpretation um, their perspective is that the interpretation runs from either July 18th or being generous July 25th. Have we got that right? Mm -hmm. um, and I heard Mr. Aldiraji say that it, no, it would run from the Tim Phoenix, is it Tim? I'm sorry. Tim Phoenix letter of um, <coughs> September 12th. But I think it's important that the interpretation at issue, at least the way I interpret the ordinance, is with respect to the code enforcement officer's interpretation not an attorney that he's retained. Um, I think, just extrapolating a little bit, if there was a follow-up from the code officer on that um, Mr. Phoenix, or Attorney Phoenix's letter, I don't, and I don't know what the evidence is in that regard, um, you know, if there was a, a, a determination on that, as Attorney Saucier said, additional information provided, that additional argument with respect to the um, you know the, the information that had not been considered previously I just I just don't know if the record indicates that the code office responded to attorney Phoenix's letter on that issue on that right. additional issue right are you saying just to make sure I understand what you're saying you're saying were were there any kind of interpretations that Irish that the code officer issued after November or uh, September 12th correct I don't I don't believe so uh, there were there were some emails about asking her to to mm -hmm. provide it or or asking the town attorney to provide an interpretation mm -hmm. um, but there was never any interpretation um, just from a and again I, I sort of think they're sort of I, I do think the town is looking to have to move this forward I want to say that for the record the mm -hmm. town wants to work I was you know I was given the direction the town wants to work Aldaraji, Mr. Aldaraji to move this forward wants to be produ productive so one two suggestions I have it are mm -hmm. to the extent that you find that it was untimely and appears to be untimely from my perspective that you could either and I, I actually don't think you have the jurisdiction this one thing you could do is remand it um, for an interpretation or I think what I've said tonight, with, with permission of the code officer, is that the code officer would be willing to entertain a new building permit application, the one it was previously back in J July, with this information. The only thing that I, and again to Attorney Rachel, I don't know how to do this, but it, it's a concern that the board's final determination to me was that it's a violation. So it's sort of with the tacit understanding. Meaning the previous decision. The previous yes. yeah. uh, position about the 2007. That's kind of the, that's in the file, right? So she can't ignore it. That's in the file that that was a violation. So the only thing I would say is to the extent that the board is willing to, say, to the extent there are new facts and new information, that that's a new scenario. And that would, I think, give the code officer the authority, or at least the comfort, that she could take a fresh look at the 2007 conveyances, given the information that Mr. Uh, Alderaji has provided, um, and not run afoul of your previous decision. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's kind of what we need mm -hmm. from the board, and then the then the code officer is is willing to take a look at that with that information. And I think there's a reasonable argument in there. That certainly makes sense to me. Um, the question I have is, if we go ahead and do that, do we need to? Does this board need to? do something with the fact of find, finding a fact that we have? Do we need to look at that information? So, so uh, this is a very novel situation, I will say. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of um, thinking out of the box, so to speak. But I, it, it, were you to determine that this, appe not appeal, but this application was untimely, you could make that determination. And also, as Attorney Saucier had um, indicated, make a finding that 
we, you know, we determine that there is additional information that has been presented that makes this a different animal, so to speak, from our prior um, decision. Arguably, if it's untimely, you might not need to make that, but in order to be practical and fair to the applicant, and everybody here in this room seems to want to get to, right. you know, right. uh, uh, unclog the drain, so right. to speak, um, I, I think that that makes perfect sense from a practical standpoint, and I don't think there's anything illegal about that. No. So. I think it makes sense, and from a, from the town's perspective, I think probably from the applicant's perspective, it makes more sense to cut to the chase, right, which is that we want an, we want an answer on the building permit that was submitted and and, um, and not have, you know, have appeals based on. Right, and just go on, that's what I'm concerned with, right. so we find this untimely, but we're willing we to work, get to but an we answer. still don't right. have the jurisdiction to do that, so we're mm -hmm. back here again, yes. Yes. hearing another, yes. hearing the case yes. again. So that kind of finding that you suggested, um, that that you heard testimony that there's additional information, and that it even be, I think it doesn't hurt to even say. And we find, and we so and find. That the code off, and yeah. you so find, and the mm -hmm. code officer uh, will review the building application with that new information. Can I ask for some clarification, if it's yes, okay, please. Mr. Chairman? Um, what I'm assuming, and you know what they say about assuming, but the building application would not be with respect to the map and lot indicated on the application, but on the map and lot for the property that Mr. Eldaraji actually owns and which may have been the subject of this. That's right. Okay. I understand there was the correct. Yes. Yeah, okay. there was. He the originally permit. applied with yeah. the correct map and lot okay. to this for, for the building permit. The this application is different, but and I don't want to prejudge anything. Of course. There, look at the application. There may be other issues. There may not be other issues. Mm -hmm. But as it relates to 2007, I think we're willing to kind of move beyond that at this point and mm -hmm. look at the application with the information that's been provided. Mm -hmm. So, um, just for Mr. Aldaraji's benefit, and so everybody here understands what I think is possible, possibly a resolution here. Okay. And I'm speaking hypothetically because. We have made you it. are the board and right. you make your decision. But in the event that this um, board determined that the request before you right now is untimely, based on the chronology that we've heard from the code office, that um, you know there would also be a finding that based on additional information presented, this makes this a different situation from the past, um, the, the past findings in fact in conclusions, which essentially would not hamstring the code enforcement officer from taking a fresh look at a new building permit application. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. this would that. only be on the findings that we had back originally on the initial subdivision. And the yes, and seven. Yeah. Yes, and, and and just to be clear, yeah. and uh, you know, Phil had mentioned this before, but I want to make sure this. You know, this is a lot of legalese, so I want to make sure everybody understands this. Is that. Um, I, I think it it's quite right that because the code enforcement officer was facing a determination that this was an illegal subdivision, that she her hands were tied and she's not going to essentially um, end run the ZBA's decision. Right. Right. However, as I think is implicit in what we're talking about, is that you know ZBAs are not a precedent-setting board, so you are not bound by a prior decision because you're being or could be presented with new and additional mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. And in that event, th that you're looking at it afresh. So okay. um, is, is that a fair? That's fair to me. Yeah. Mr. Algiorgi, are you OK with what's been discussed? <clears throat> uh, yes, that does sound promising. I just wanted to you know, go back in regards to the timely thing, because I didn't get a chance sure. to finish talking about that or maybe new at this point, but I mean, there was discussion after the letter was written and there was email back and forth between Mrs. Griffith and uh, Mr. Phoenix. The email's right here if anybody wants to see it. But it seems like that may be moot now. Um, so back to the billing permit. I did receive a billing permit already from Mrs. Griffith, so I would just like it reinstated if that's possible. It was rescinded the day I, I received it. It would not be able to be reinstated. You only have 30 days from the time that it's... And that wouldn't be within this board's purview yeah. to. I don't have to pay another thirty-six hundred dollars, though, right? I'm going to charge you five million. No, 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 <laughs> no. And then you know better. Okay. We'll, we'll, I told you we'd work that out. Okay. So, 
<coughs> I'm going to kind of look at the board right now, and we've had some discussion back and forth here. Does the board have any other questions about where we seem to be headed at this point in time? No, I just I wanted to clarify um, that this only has to do with the 2007 um, facts Decision. of finding that we finding of facts that we found. It has nothing to do with um, the rest of it, the property as it exists now and right. that kind of thing. It has nothing. Right. We're, we've we're not only been presented information on the split, the original split. Yeah. And and mm -hmm. and that's what the. Yeah. Findings are going to indicate. Yes, I think that is accurate. Um, but what is standard reason if you're finding the, the 2007 um, Pellegrino split to be legal when that just fix everything else that happened after? Because before you were saying everything else that happened after was illegal. So now that you're finding that what he did is legal, everything else after should be legal. We didn't hear anything on, basically on that. We, our finding was on the original piece. That's, that's what our finding is was on. So, whatever has happened in the after that, you're going to have to work with the town in determining what the status of your property is right now. What we're talking about is only the original split, and that's what we found in our findings. That's when we basically couldn't move forward from that because that after that we couldn't fix what had already been done we've heard evidence now that says that that split appears to be is is accurate it was done properly that's what the findings of this board will say is that that split was we found that that split to be okay now the code officer can look at the permit and um, Go, go not be tied to the decision we made uh, on our last finding. Okay, fantastic. <clears throat> and I think you have something under 14 in regards to your rules that says that uh, any land use ordinance may be changed or amended by a majority vote of board members present at a regular meeting after the proposed changes have been read at one previous regular meeting. So I don't know if that pertains to this. I just wanted to, that's number 14 on your okay. list. Thank you. Um, what I, I'm going to ask you what we need to do because sure. I'm not entirely sure now. Sure, I know this is this is a um, <laughs> uncharted territory. <laughs> so I think what I would suggest is, um, if memory serves, we were talking about the timeliness right. prong, and I don't think I heard a motion, you know, made or seconded or discussed that you may want to make a determination on the timeliness issue. And um, once you do so, you could also address, and I, I, I think that, um, I haven't heard you direct me to draft findings, but it, can I assume that that is something yes, the board would like me to do? Um, in which case, you may want to direct there to be a specific finding and conclusion regarding um, that, you know, the code enforcement officer should not be bound by the previous decision because there is new information and argument that has come to light which um, makes it a different animal essentially. I like that because I, I don't want to set precedent on the timeliness. I mean the ordinance says we have 30 days and if it's past that we would have no jurisdiction. And so but based on what we've talked about we are also going to have a finding after that and I'm comfortable with that. Is that something that the board would be comfortable with? Yeah. Okay. So I guess I'm looking for a motion to that we don't have standing to hear this appeal because the timeliness was not, the 30 day time limit was not met. Is that accurate? Do we have a second uh, motion on that? Sure, we'll Mr. Woods has moved the motion. Is there a second? I'll second. So we have a motion and a second. Um, so any, all in favor of denying basically the, the application because of time, because it didn't meet the 30 day time limit. All in favor? Okay. So now, have we ever, 
we've opened the hearing. Mm -hmm. now, now where do we go? Because we have, still have a hearing that's open, but we guess what we need to find the yes. finding of fact now? Um, you do, and and I think based on... I think based on the conversation that I've heard that I can provide uh, findings and conclusions for your consideration and adoption at your next meeting. Now, I will say, and of course I don't have it in front of me, but I believe that there's a requirement that um, there be a vote, um, a final vote. And, and I think what I would suggest is that we, I, I've heard what your direction is, and that I draft up appropriate findings and that we can re, re, reconvene. reconvene and you can review, exercise your independent judgment, make sure that they're consistent with what we've you know, talked about today and that you can do a final vote to adopt them then. So basically we'll close the hearing mm -hmm. and we still have a 45, I think it's 45 days to reach a decision or something yeah. like that. But we have time. Yes, I mean, I, I think what, what makes sense is actually that we get a date certain to get back here. Certainly. Um, and I don't think it's necessary and I'm happy to come. Um, I won't be if offended if I'm not invited to the party, but right. I'll provide you with draft findings, findings that you can review. And and of course, don't just adopt them. Make sure you review them. Make sure that they are consistent come, with what, what you're... What Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay, so then we will close the hearing, and then let's set a date that we can meet. I guess I want to give you, how much time will you need? I can get these done in a couple weeks. Okay. If that works. I just don't, when's your next regular meeting? Well, typically we meet the second Wednesday of every month. So that would be what? December 13th. December 13th. I will Is that, would that be that. acceptable to everybody? Okay. So I think that we'll set the next meeting for our regularly scheduled meeting. 1800 okay. uh, at the time. Yeah, what time do we want to meet? 536, which what's convenient for this board? 530, 530, okay. So we'll set a meeting for a regularly scheduled meeting on uh, the second Wednesday to review the finding of facts that we've discussed here at this meeting. And uh, that will include an unbounding right. from our last Yep. Which isn't before. Good enough. If, right. Does that get uh, We've got a couple more orders of business. We have to approve some minutes and stuff. But uh, I think that pretty much ends this portion of the agenda. I'm not going. Thanks. Very good. Thanks, okay. May I steal some of this stuff? I just want to yes. share the old three. Always. This is this. I think I think they have some duplication here. Right? I mix some stuff up. Okay. Too, yeah. No, I'll just I'm gonna ask oh, um, Terry just okay, yeah. right. thank you for yes, sharing. Sir, no I well that's all right, we'll do it at the end. So Let's let everyone kind of clear out for a few minutes and then we'll, we'll the only thing we have left on the agenda is still two of the minutes. It shouldn't take long. But we'll let it really take Do we all have a copy of the minutes? Uh, they're right there. They were pretty brief. Okay. Where are the could, could we ask? Where are the minutes? Um, <laughs> all right. Could I ask if you could go outside um, so that we can complete our meeting, sir? Could you just step outside so we can complete the meeting? That's okay. Good night. Light at the end of the tunnel, ladies. Okay, Pat. Did you get a copy of those minutes? I book somewhere. I don't know. I, I was looking. If, oh, I may not. There's a copy there. I may not have. Pretty much, we just opened the meeting Ages. so that we could approve the minutes of the meeting before. This is it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are we okay with the, the minutes as written? Oh yeah. All right. Um, let's, do we have a motion to accept the minutes of what was that? So moved. September 13th. September 13th. We've got a motion. We have a second. I'll second. Who made the motion? I'm sorry. Ernie and Jacob. 
Sorry. <laughs> now, I think the last thing I need is a motion to adjourn. Do we have a motion to, to, easy. Like to make a motion to adjourn from Mr. Cotton meeting. adjourns for the first motion, second motion? I agree. Pat agrees. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you very much. We'll get through it.